Thank you for inviting me, Max Foundation, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Manmohan. I'm from the spine unit of Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, first, just a basic structure of how your bone typically looks like. I won't go so much in depth. There's just, if this is a long bone, I'm talking about this is the femur, this bone, this is the femur, okay? You have the upper end and the lower end. The upper ends are softer. These are softer bones. The epiphyses are softer bones. The centerpiece are diaphyseal bone. These are harder bones. Okay, these are the ones that actually gives you more of your stability in the bone. If you see a T bone steak that we usually eat a steak, it normally comes like that. You know, you can see a bone in the center. The softer portion is the trabecular bone, and the outer harder one that we usually don't really get into. That's the cortical bone. That's a harder bone. Okay, in any bone you see any meat, you come across a bone, you have a harder outer portion. That's a cortical bone. The inside, the softer one there. Your can. Cancer always starts there. Your marrow is also there. Okay, so your marrows are all in the center, not outside. Okay, but the marrow in the center that, that where the cancer starts off can actually destroy the outer uh, cortical bone, which actually causes the for you to lose your stability. So this is a normal chicken bone that I got. I got a picture of a chicken bone. So you know, remember at the end of the time after you eat, you can actually bite off this portion. Uh, we can actually bite off this portion, but this portion is a bit difficult to bite, okay? Because these plates are actually very soft. These are epiphyseal part of your bone. These are very soft, okay? So that is why it's easier for you to bite. The, the structural support is by this side, the diaphyseal, the long bone, okay? Any long bone. Long bone we are talking about here, the arm, the hand, the femur, the tibia. These are all your long bones, okay? When we are talking about long bones, we are talking about these kind of bones. So again, basically, this is your head of the femur, meaning if, if, if you have a hip bone, that center, the bullet thing, that socket thing, you have a socket, that, that is the portion that they actually cut off, okay? I'm showing you. There's an outer portion, which is the cortical bone, which is harder. And you have the center marrow portion. Your marrow portion has a red marrow and a yellow marrow. So there's two kinds of marrow in our center portion. Sum sum tulang. Normally sometimes when you break the chicken, you can suck out the sum sum tulang. It's the same thing. Okay? So you got a red portion, you got a yellow portion. Okay? This is in all our body. Okay? So at birth, all our bones are red marrow. That means from the top to bottom. Every bone in our body are red marrow. From the end of the bone to below every single bone. As we age, the bone, the red marrow has been replaced by yellow marrow. So it's more of fat. So we have fat. We have a lot of fat in our marrow. Only certain parts of the bone has red marrow left. That means the ends of the bone. This is still the femur. I'm talking about the thigh bone. So if you see the thigh bone at the level of the hip, at the level of the knee, you still have a bit of red marrow. Okay. So your tumour tends to originate from the red portion because these are the active part of your uh, leukemia cells. Your leukemia cells are coming from here, the red, red marrow. They don't come from yellow marrow. Yellow, yellow marrow is not active. It's just fatty tissues. Okay. So these are where your tumour tends to come from. So at birth, the whole body is red marrow and we progress to childhood formally rather than maturity. Maturity means at 25 years old, we only left certain areas of red marrow, which is from the skull, the spine, the ribs, the pelvis and certain places in the upper part of your arm bones and your thigh bones. Okay, for me, it's called a humerus and a um, femur bone. So I will use I will use some layman here. Okay, if you guys understand, just if you don't understand, just stop me. Okay, no problem. So in the humerus, this portion. In the femur, this portion. Okay. So you need to beware at these areas. Okay, because these areas are not. If you have pain around here and here, we are less worried. But if you say pain here. And you told me pain here, and we are a bit more worried. Or if you complain pain around here, around the shoulder, around the neck, we know because this is where your tumour will arise. This is where your fracture will come from. This is where the lytic lesions will come from. Okay, I'm not worried if you come and tell me your ankle pain, your knee pain, I may just brush it off. Okay, because I know it doesn't come from there. Okay, it's not that I won't treat you all. I will treat you all. But I know in my back of my mind, this, this is where it's going to come from. If, I, if you're going to be referred to me. So, which bones are affected? Again, based on that previous picture, you know. If you're, going to, if you're going to look for yourself, you're going to need to know that this portion is where I'm worried. Okay, So, these are the bones that are going to be affected. The skull, the pelvis, the hips, the humerus, and the spine. Okay, So, these are your target bones that you need to be worried about. If you're, going to, you're a caregiver or you're a patient, these are the bones that you need to worry, worry about. 
So what does myeloma do to my bone? I already this was this been discussed by Dr. B. So 90% of individuals in multiple myeloma will develop osteo osteolytic bone lesions. There are two kinds of bone lesions, which is osteoblastic and osteolytic. Osteoblastic lesions are bone forming lesions. Certain cancers like prostate cancers are bone forming tumors. Okay, so the tumor tend to form a lot of bone. Okay. In multiple myeloma, they are osteolytic lesions. They are destructive lesions. They create holes in the bone like that. Okay, so the top portion is healthy. The below portion, this is exactly the area where it becomes lytic. Okay, so these are dangerous lesions. About 90% of individuals will have this. Okay, so this is what we are worried about when we see this. Am I too fast or too slow? Is it okay? Okay, clear? Can hear? Okay, thank you. So what will happen to my bone? Two possibilities. You either present to us with pain or you present to us with fracture. Okay, so two common things that we manage. We predominantly don't manage multiple myeloma, never been seen by orthopedic surgeon or spine surgeon unless it's a referral to us because of a skeletal related event or a problem with your bone. Okay, if it's not, it's predominantly managed by your hematologist, which they are doing a pretty well good job. Okay, it's only that we are referred to us if there is a problem with stability of the bone. That means if the bone is impending fracture or the pain is intractable that is not resolving, then they refer to us. So we only see these two kinds of patients. They come with severe pain or they come with a fracture. If it's a fracture, there are two possibilities. The long bones, which I've mentioned, the humerus, the radius ulna and the thigh, commonly humerus and femur, the thigh bones. Okay, so we see 30% of these patients. The other 70%, which is the majority, are spine. The majority of the times are spine-related problems. Okay, so spine-related problems they can present with cord compression, meaning the tumor has spread and caused cord compression, or the tumor didn't cause cord compression, just has affected the spine but didn't cause any cord compression. So these are majority of the type of patients we see in the orthopedic outpatient department or in the emergency department. Okay, am I at risk of fracture? In 30% of cases, multiple myeloma is usually diagnosed after fracture. Usually what happens is retrospectively, we normally uh, see a fracture and we thought it uh, looks a bit suspicious, doesn't look like a typical fracture from a fall or something. So we will take, do an MRI, we will do a biopsy and it turns out multiple myeloma. So a lot of times it's not that you got multiple myeloma, then you got fracture. We actually see a fracture first, then we decided, oh, this is multiple myeloma. So it usually happens in 30%. 78% of the time, the fractures are in the axial skeleton. I've already mentioned earlier in the previous slide why the axial skeletons. Axial skeletons are referring to the skull, the spine, the rib. Okay, so these are your axial skeletons. Okay, most of the time will be here because your red marrow are still very active here compared to the other parts of your body, which are all yellow fatty marrow. So again, um, axial means what? Oh, sorry, axial means your skull, your spine, and your rib cage. Yes, yes. So all the center bones are called axial bones. All your periphery bones are called long bones. Okay. okay. So these are the typical areas where multiple myeloma is affected. So these are axial skeleton. Um, I do not know what kind of staging systems are being used nowadays for management in multiple myeloma. I, I, I do read there's two. So if I use the ISS staging, stage 3 are the one that commonly develops uh, fractures. That's what, uh, based on my reading, but I may be wrong. So I think the best is the hematologist to actually answer this. Um, current management, I guess you guys would know anti-myeloma chemotherapy is still used, uh, plus minus bisphosphonates. In our country, I, uh, like I said, uh, multiple myeloma is predominantly managed by hematologists, never, never by us. I do not start any of these drugs. They are already on these drugs by the time they come to us. Some centers do use bisphosphonates, some do not use, some based on whether the patient have a skeletal uh, related events or whether they have a lytic lesion or what stage is the patient on. I'm not very sure about this. Some start on calcium, some don't start because currently there are numerous contradicting studies whether calcium should be started or not been started. I'm not sure about this. Maybe it's, guess, it's best that we ask Dr. B after this. Uh, I so maybe need to ask him. <laughs> So these are a lot of uh, new studies regarding the role of these drugs, okay? But I think bisphosphonate is quite commonly used in uh, overseas. Um, there, there was one question regarding um, Zometa. Zolidronic acid is Zometa. 
Okay, uh, some centers use pemidronate, some centers use zolidronate. These are all bisphosphonate groups of drugs. We commonly prescribe these drugs in the orthopedic unit for patients such as um, very severe osteoporosis, uh, children with very osteoporotic bones. There are conditions where the bone quality is not good in children. We do prescribe these drugs. Uh, they, these drugs are also prescribed for cancers uh, such as breast cancer, renal cancer, thyroid cancer or prostate cancers that actually cause lytic or bone destruction. We do start these drugs in our centre. But multiple myeloma patients are usually started by the haematologist. The preference, uh, so far studies have shown there's not much difference between this group or this group. It depends on the patient tolerance. So some people might be on this, some people might be on that, but certainly the outcome is almost the same based on large scale studies. At the moment, this question should be still addressed to the hematologist, not to me again. <laughs> Sorry, we... <laughs> uh, okay. There were some questions regarding, um, can I exercise, can I not exercise, since my bone quality is not good and uh, there's a risk of 70% developing bone quality. I normally will look at the patient as a whole. I will ask, I will look at the stage of his cancer at the moment. I will look at his renal function and I will look, is, is he how anemic, what's his hemoglobin count like? How much is his pain? Is he after chemotherapy, before chemotherapy, or did he go radiotherapy? All these I will look as a whole. Then I will decide whether how much can I um, let this patient exercise. Okay. Sometimes we do order skeletal survey and MRI to see whether the spine is involved. Then based on this whole thing, I will decide how much activity I can actually allow my patient to go. If this patient having a lot of uh, lesions in the spine, he's quite advanced stage of the disease, his renal function is not good. He's always fatigued and tired because of anemia. He's in severe pain and he's post-chemotherapy. I will normally don't advise my patients for that. So it differs from patient to patient. Okay, so we have to see them as a whole. Normally, I do encourage almost all my patients for some sort of activity. I advocate low impact activity. This goes for even non-cancer patients such as severe osteoporosis. I will always suggest these three group of exercise for my elderly patients with either spine problem or non-spine orthopedic problems with osteoporosis. These are low impact exercises, okay? Cycling, swimming and brisk walking are low impact. They don't put a lot of stress or mechanical stress on the long bones or on the spine, okay? These are all low impact. So it's encouraged for you to do these sort of exercises, okay? So for me, I believe motion is life. You cannot stop walking. Nobody should tell you, you know, you should rest in the bed, don't move about because your bone quality is not good, your spine is not good, you should just stay at home, don't walk around, you will fall, you'll break something. No, we can't really tell this to the patient. Even though how old patients come to me and they tell me, you don't tell me to sit on a wheelchair and don't move from the house. Okay, it's not really advisable. We should be moving. Okay, so as long as my patient can walk, he's okay, I will tell him to walk. And he asks me exercises, I will always offer these three. Because once you don't exercise, the bone quality will deteriorate further. Okay, if you're already remaining bone quality, which is nice and you don't move, it will become disused osteoporosis. Meaning, even though there's no disease there, it can still become uh, atrophic. It still can become dystrophic. So it will become osteoporosis in the other side. So I do advocate exercises. We shouldn't stop in movement. How reliable is a bone density test? Um, actually, the problem with bone density tests is there's numerous bone density. Some are doing ultrasound heel therapy, some are doing bone density. Um, bone density test does give you a general marker but about how osteoporosis you are, but it doesn't tell you what is the risk of you getting a fracture because of pathological problems. For instance, if it's a pure osteoporosis, Without a cancer patient, I can predict what is the fracture rate. Okay, but if it's a multiple myeloma who comes with a BMD, it's not actually giving you a good marker whether even though this patient has a good BMD, this patient has a poor BMD, but both are multiple myeloma patients, we cannot actually predict the fracture. Okay, so it's that in that sense, um, if I have a very poor BMD and the patient complains of pain somewhere, I will do a skeletal survey or I'll do an MRI. Then I will compare. But if so, uh, what I'm saying is uh, BMD is, for me is not very reliable in multiple myeloma. Some patients can have very good BMD in multiple myeloma, they still develop pathological fracture because it doesn't give you a good guide. But if, if you see an osteoporotic patient, it does give you a good guide. It gives you a good guide whether this patient is osteoporotic, this patient is uh, normal, this patient has a probability of developing a fracture higher. But multiple myeloma is very difficult for us to say. Uh, did that answer the question? Yeah. So, um, so if you've got a fracture, whether it's a long bone or spine, 
we need to manage this okay so first just just let's just get rid of this spine first we just talk about these long bone fractures first okay so long bone i'm talking about either the femur or the humerus these are two common areas you either present to us with either a frank fracture like that or just a lesion which is painful okay so you can present to us in these two end of spectrums okay these two spectrums so if i got a fracture we normally will see the patient if you just present to me with a lesion like this is the normal bone this is the multiple myeloma bone okay so if you cut open this is what we will see so that is why the quality of the bone is not good so it tends to break easily because it's very fragile the cortex which is supposed to be very thick it's already very thinned out like that okay so the inside which is supposed to have very nice healthy tissue is no longer healthy tissue it's all filled with this material okay which which are not giving you any stability at all so this is what happens so this lesion is represented by this tissue okay so if we determine after doing some scoring system and all we decide whether we need to fix or not sometimes you come to us you have a lesion and we do, uh, even though it's not fractured the doctor said no you have to do something you have to fix it because we have a system to check whether your bone is going to fracture in the next one or two months okay based on this scoring system we know what is your probability of this going to fracture if you come to us with this lesion somewhere in the humerus or in the femur and told me it's severely painful and the next time the doctor tells you or oh, you have to put a surgery you have to put a long implant from here to here because we know as soon as you start weight bearing this is going to break i mean this is if this breaks it's more difficult to manage when it's not broken so it's easier to manage we can put a simple surgery very fast minimal invasive we can put an implant in without subjecting you to a very large extensive surgery but if it breaks is a bigger problem for us so we need to decide to fix you or not to fix you when you present to us with this problem okay the decision we make is based on some really clinical x-rays looking at x-rays looking at the patient as a whole and looking at some parameters which are all clinically proven parameters this only happen doctor if we have a painful Situation, Usually, a pain is a good indicator that the bone is actually going to fracture. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, no. If you do not have any pain, usually the bone is quite normal. The first symptom you will start getting is pain. These pains are usually very difficult to manage with analgesia, your painkillers, and they don't respond to chemo or radiotherapy. That means we know it's a potential impending fracture. Okay, if I see an X-ray. You come with this. You tell me you have already taken so much of medication. You are having a lot of pain. You given steroid, given all anti myeloma therapy. You are still having pain. I look at this one. I know this is going to break. Okay, nobody is going to prevent this from breaking. So we need to do something before it breaks. Okay, so a pain is a good indicator. Intractable pain is a good in indicator. So if I got a fracture, what can we do? The reason why we fix this fracture is for immediate mobilization. Sometimes a fracture in a normal person is also difficult. For a patient with multiple myeloma with a fracture is more difficult. Okay, so we need to make sure whatever we do, we need to get you immediate mobilization. That's the main reason we are doing surgery. We want you to start walking and weight bearing immediately. That's the aim of our surgery, to protect the entire bone. Okay, if that bone its involvement is here we will make sure we protect the whole bone that means we remove the tumor material the whole bone but if the if we do an mri and we found out that it's only confined up to here it's not the whole bone then we could actually fix it by keeping the whole bone itself okay but if we find out that the whole bone is involved and is totally unstable is totally no use keeping this bone so we would replace it so there's two ways we do a replacement surgery or we do a fixation surgery it will depend on how bad is your fracture where is the fracture located and how extensive is the disease okay so simple thing this is quite simple minimal invasive don't worry about the rod it looks very scary but actually we can do this very fast with very minimal incisions okay this is a little bit more difficult because this is a mega process is meaning we'll remove your whole femur and replace it with this okay so it depends on where you present so the op choice of implant will again depend on the overall prognosis if the patient's prognosis is not too good he will never be able to take the stress of this surgery okay he will be able to take the stress of this surgery but not this surgery okay so a lot of factors 
Again, the type of fixation depends on location, what location, which bones are fractured, okay? So that, there's a lot of things for us to consider. So the decision is made after a long discussion with a lot of orthopedic surgeons and based on a um, few imagings, we will decide whether what is best for you. Uh, so if your spine fractures, which happens in 70% of the time, they can compress the cord or they cannot compress the cord, okay? So if this happens, we need to know what to do for each patient, okay? So what happens in spine, these lesions, what you are seeing are basically the myeloma tissues. These, these, these small, small lesions is what you see in your MRI. Sometimes they take an MRI, they tell you, oh, you have a lesion here, there, here and there. This is what is happening, okay? It has eaten up part of your bones, okay? Part of your bone here and here, okay? So you can present again with pain or neurological symptoms. Neurological meaning you have already involved your nerve, your spinal cord or the nerve roots which are coming out. Okay. Neurological is for the brain, right? Um, my next slide will show you exactly what are neurological symptoms. Okay. So painful spine options, radiotherapy, antimyeloma, chemotherapy, brace. I do advocate brace for patients with uh, a lesion in the spine. This, these are the typical brace we, we, we give to patients who are having uh, uh, a lesions to the spine. These are called Juwet brace. It's about 850 ringgit. So I do advocate patients with multiple lesions to the spine to wear a brace, okay? Because it keeps your bone upright, doesn't keep you in progressive flexion. Once your spine is destroyed, you will continue going into progressive flexion. So we, we keep this kind of brace to majority of our patients with lesions to the spine, okay? Spine surgery is advocated if you have failed radiotherapy, you have failed chemotherapy and your brace and painkiller is not actually helping you, okay? If you fail all these three, and you are still in a lot of pain, we, we will advise you for a surgery, okay? Again, uh, painful spine. Painful spining, spine means what I'm saying is from the previous slide, we are only talking about pain in this case, okay? We're not talking about neurological symptoms, okay? Neurological symptoms means I'm talking about no cord involvement, no spinal cord involvement, no nerve root involvement, okay? Just pain. That means you presented to us with a lesion in the spine and you are just presenting to us with pain. Okay, what we normally, we normally do is, we, we call a procedure called kyphoplasty, okay? This is a video that I, we normally do, what, what kind of cases we normally do is, this kind of cases we normally do in HKL. Yeah. So we'll do a small incision, we will put in two probes into your spinal <laughs> bone. This is your vertebrae bone which is collapsed. So what we'll do is we'll inject a balloon to bring up your spine back to its normal height, okay? This is a collapsed spine, okay? That's where the space was occupied with your tumor material. Once we deflate, we take out the balloon, we will inject a kind of cement into the bone, okay? This is called a kyphoplasty procedure, okay? This is routinely done for patients with painful spine but not, uh, not having any cord compression, okay? It's a very minimal invasive surgery. We will do it with a two small incision, one by one centimeter over both sides and uh, we will inject this cement. This will give you stability, will reduce your pain and will also give you a very, very stable spine. So it, it is good for patients who, are, who have failed that conventional therapy that I've mentioned, okay? This is kyphoplasty, okay? The second procedure is slightly different. Uh, this is an X-ray of kyphoplasty. That's how the cement will look like. Okay, there are two types of cement. One is permanent, one is not permanent. Okay, um, permanent cement is uh, polymethyl metacrylate. These are permanent. Okay, they give you structural support, but it won't interfere with you in any way. Okay, it will remain in the spine. It gives you a very good support where the tumor material is there. Now it's replaced by cement, so it's structurally very stable. We've been using the cement for almost 50, 60 years, so don't worry about the side effect. There's almost no 60 years we've been using for almost all procedures in spine in in orthopedic. Yeah. Oh. Okay, the other procedure is called vertebroplasty. It's quite similar with the first procedure. Yeah, the same thing. Again, the involves it uh, involve uh, vertebral column. We put in again a cannula. This is percutaneous again, both sides, and we inject cement. But this time we don't put a balloon. In this kind of cases, meaning that there is a lesion in the spine, but the spine is 
quite stable. It's mechanically stable. It's not collapsed. It's not banco. It's, it's there. It's nice. But just that it's painful. Because the tumor material is a lot inside that. It's causing a lot of pain. It's not responding to radiotherapy, chemotherapy. We will inject this thing. This thing is actually very hot. Okay. So besides destroying the tumor material, it also gives you a structural support. Okay. It doesn't use a balloon. So this two kind of procedure which is done for painful spine. But no deficit. Okay. So, but what happens if um, spine fractures with neurological deficit? Okay, this is a question, what is neurological? Neurological meaning nerves, okay? So, if you have neurological deficit, you can present to us with weakness of the limbs. You can present with us with numbness of the limbs. You can present with us with difficulty in walking. That means you have a balance problem, okay? Sometimes a lesion on the spine can give you, you don't have weakness, you don't have numbness, but you can't balance. The way you walk is not balanced. Or you have difficulty controlling your bowel and bladder. Or sometimes you don't present with any of this, you, you, co you complain of a very shooting pain going to your limbs or your hands, okay? So if this happens, we know your spinal cord has been compromised or your nerve root has been affected, okay? So what happens, this, these are typical pictures that you see. You see, that's your cord. That's your bone. You have a small canal there. The yellow portion is your cord. You have a very small room for your cord, okay? Sometimes tumours can come from the back. Okay, your multiple myeloma tumors can come from the back. Sometimes they can come from the front. Okay, so the back one is this. Okay, this is the back. It can come from the back and it gives you a very narrow cord. So your cord actually has no room to breathe. But right, your spinal cord, sepatutnya ada air di depan dan di belakang. So the white portion is the water. So this white portion is your water. So you're supposed to have water in front and behind. But this thing has occupied all the space and your cord is so narrow. If this happens to you, you will have weakness. You will be paraplegic or paraparesis. That means you can't walk. Okay? So, sometimes, in here, the bone is alright. But there is a tumor material pressing on the cord. But sometimes, there is no tumor material in the back. But the bone is fractured. It's totally collapsed and it's fractured. So, the compression can happen from the front or from the back. So, you have, you have to know where the compression is coming. And that's how we address the cord. So, once you come to us with this, we will ask for an urgent MRI. We will look at how much your cord is affected and we will decide what's the next course of action. Okay, so these are typically. Okay, so whether we do surgery on or don't do any surgery on you for a patient with a neurological problem, we will decide on few factors. Okay, first we need to decide whether the thing that is actually pressing on the cord is soft tissue. Soft tissue means it's soft. Okay, or is it bone? Okay, sometimes it's bone that is pressing the cord. That means the bone is fractured and it's pressing on the cord. Sometimes it's just a tumor material that is actually causing one small compression on the cord. So we need to determine which one, okay, based on the MRI. Next, we need to decide whether this is actually just that shooting pain, which, which we call radiculopathy, or you are having frank numbness or weakness, okay. So we need to know which one is the spectrum. If it's this side, the management is different. This side, the management is different. Finally, we need to know what's your prognosis. If you come to us with a very end stage of the condition and you're generally, you're not fit, we can't really subject you to spine surgery because spine surgery is a big surgery. Okay, the recovery takes very long. Okay, so we don't want to subject patients who are very frail to this kind of surgery. Okay, as anesthetist also will not pass you for surgery. Okay, and the risk is great. Okay, so we don't simply want to subject. So we need to determine everything before we proceed. Okay, we'll, we'll involve a lot of investigations, but we tend to do it urgently. These are all under emergencies. Okay, patient present to us with weakness, numbness are all done under emergency. Okay, so. Typical decompression and stabilization. When I'm talking about the earlier patients, we are not doing any decompression. Decompression meaning I'm giving room for your cord to live. Okay. So the earlier patient, we are just injecting something to give you stabilization, support. If decompression, this is what we typically do. Sorry, I cannot remove the watermark. So you, you uh, that, this is a very good video I use for all my patients. Okay. So you'll be on this position. We will clean up that area. Normally, the incision will depend on how many levels of uh, spine is involved, okay? So, we will do an incision from the back, okay? We will see from the back. We have all the surgeries from the back. Usually, in multiple myeloma, most of the surgeries from back. We will... Why oh, this is so bright? Can't see. Oh, this is not good. Um, yeah. So, the back portions, 
are removed the back portion of the spine. That means we don't touch the front. We only start from the back. We remove all the back portion of the spine. These are your back portions of your spine. Okay, you're seeing from the back. Okay, the yellow portions are your nerve roots. Okay, that's your nerve roots and that's your cord. So we will start opening the back. If the tumor is at the back, we will remove the tumor from the back. Okay, but if the tumor is from the front, we will not go to the front to disturb the tumor. What we are doing is we are just giving you enough room for the cord to leave. Okay, so if there's a compression coming from the front, we will remove everything from the back and gives you enough space for your cord. Okay, most of the time after this surgery, we can't just left, leave your cord like that hanging. We need to stabilize the spine. Okay, stabilization is done via screws and rods. Okay. Yeah, it's, it looks a bit scary, I understand, but we do this on a daily basis in Hospital Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> Not just for cancer patients, for every sort of patients. That means a fracture, old patients with back pain, children. These are done almost on daily basis in Hospital Kuala Lumpur. So once we have given you all enough space for your cord to live, got enough room for him to breathe, then we will put screws, okay? This will actually help you in pain, okay? Because these are very strong stabilization implants, so you will not have much pain. And then your cord has a good room. So almost every level where we have removed your posterior area of your bone, we will put this, okay? Uh, this screw is... Um, we use a special, um, we have a special monitoring device to see your cord. Okay, so when we are doing the surgery, we are very close, we are working very close to the cord. But we have a special monitoring device. So what we will do is we will put like that and we put a rod so you are actually having a very stable spine. Okay, you have enough room for your cord to breathe and you have a very stable, you will have quite less, uh, we have quite painless spine after that. Okay, but there's a lot of risk for the surgery. This is how it looks in the x ray from the side view. This is where your screws are going in. This from the back, in this case, is used about six screws. But normally in myeloma, it's about 12 screws. <laughs> yeah. So there will be a limitation? No, 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 no. Usually, you don't have to worry about limitation. Okay, um, usually, most of... Yeah, definitely. You see, most of your movement don't happen in the spine. Most of your movement happen in the hip. Okay, so even though we have put screws in children with a, a condition called scoliosis where the spine is bent, we put screws from here to here. Okay, so they still have very good flexibility of the spine. Okay, we are only fusing very small area. If you fuse the whole thing also, your majority of movement is in the hip joint. Okay, your spine contributes very little to forward flexion. Okay, forward flexion is hip joint. Spine contributes only 15 degrees. So even though you put screws from top to bottom, the limitation is very minimal. In fact, most multiple myeloma patients, they are already having very limited spine movement. At certain age, your spine movement is already very little. Okay, so it's not going to make much difference. After 50, 60 years old, we don't have much flexibility of the spine. Okay, so when we age, we will have very little. So it's not going to make a big difference. Um, the thing is about this surgery is, is a bit risky, okay? So we do, do normally take a look at our patient carefully before we subject them to this. There's a lot of blood loss, the level of infection is there, uh, loosening, implant breakage, a lot of things to consider. And general anesthesia is very long for multiple myeloma patients going for this surgery. It's about 8 to 10 hours, okay? So recovery will take some time, they take longer compared to younger age group with no medical problem, take faster, wound healing is also some issues, okay? So there's a lot of things to consider before we subject patients to this surgery. Unless the benefit outweighs the, the risk, we will not do this surgery for no reason. So this is how it will look like. Sometimes uh, we will just put, uh, in, I mean, we will put a screw, we will remove the cord from the back, we will leave enough space for the cord to breathe. And if we decide, the bone is also not too good, we will give an additional cementing in front. So we support it from the back and we support it from the front, okay? So that sometimes we do. It will again differ from patient to patient and depends on how bad is the disease, at what stage the disease is, how many, how many vertebral column is involvement, all that will depend on a lot of factors. So it can be done as an open surgery, it looks very scary, that's the cord. This is one of our patients, that's the cord. So we have opened all the posterior, it looks like that, very big bloody surgery with a lot of rods. Or we can do it in a in minimal invasive, meaning we don't cut open the whole thing, 
we just make small small holes and put at the side okay yeah that's keyhole surgery okay but um, to be frank um, government of malaysia only give us money for this surgery okay this surgery requires a totally new set of instruments new set of um, implants which are way more costly okay so we do not practice this in government hospitals we practice this okay if this if patient can pay we normally ask them to pay for this okay because uh, we have limited resources we are catering for almost all patients in klang valley we provide free instrumentation for all patients with uh, any spine injuries this implant itself costs about 25000 to 30000 so this will cost slightly more maybe 40 50000 so we we don't really have the resources to do all minimal invasive okay so we tend to do this kind of surgery unless the patient say he can pay the extra and all then yes all willing he can get the minimal invasive surgery um, um surgery i am having a myeloma and taking zomita i also do exercises i go to the gym every twice a week and i always tell the trainer please don't let me carry heavy things as what doctor chang told me but sometimes these trainers are very they think that i can do it they start giving me more weight so how do i go about looking after myself and also doing the necessary uh, activities that you spoke about just now and, and then in the end i don't have to wait see you um Okay, thank you for that question. Um I didn't get your name, madam. I'm Haja Rohaya. Madam Haja, yeah. Okay. Um I think that's that's between you and your trainer. I think usually if you tell your trainer what is your limit, your trainer will normally understand, okay? Uh so you should actually tell your trainer what is your limit. If I'm also pract- I'm so going to the gym or I'm running for a marathon, I will tell my trainer what's my limit. I'm actually trying to go for a marathon. Okay, so I know my limit. So I'll tell my trainer. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to run this many kilometers for today. Okay, so I think you have to tell your trainer what are you suffering from. You have to tell them. You nice. have to tell you. Normally, I do not encourage strengthening exercises. Okay, I do yes, not. Strengthening. En- right? Yeah, strengthening meaning lifting, muscle building, bulk building. I don't encourage strengthening Exercise. exercises for pathological bone. That means a bone quality which is not good. I do not encourage strengthening exercises. Okay. Strengthening means of the bones, of the muscles, everything. Everything. That means you are using weights. Okay. I am not encouraging weight exercises. Okay. Right. What you are saying are weight exercises. Okay. Yeah. I don't encourage that. I encourage more of mobility exercises, range of movement exercises, and non-impact. Range of movement is meaning whatever my exercise is. Make sure you have mobile all your joints. If you move all your joints, that is enough activity to build your bone. You do not need to carry tables or do not need to carry 10 kg to build your bone. Right, right. So, a uh, range of movement, low impact exercises, swimming, cycling is more than enough. Walking, swimming. Walking, brisk walking, swimming, cycling is more than enough to build a good bone quality. Having babies, grandchildren. Yeah, that is the problem. You see. <laughs> so in other words we must be watchful of our yes. movement at all time at right? all time yes that that goes for almost every spine patient i do not advocate them to lift this is wrong you're not supposed to do that for even ordinary normal patients we're not supposed to be able to bend we're supposed to bend like that to lift up things we're not supposed to bend like that so even a young patient then is wrong so if you want to carry a baby like that it's wrong Okay, you're supposed to bend down, carry. And some of babies are not light. Okay, so I, I don't think you should be subjecting your spine to this much of stress. Okay. I must be very. I must uh, be on the washout. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a doctor also. I'm in exercise physiology. I'm in a sports medicine. I think Puan Haja has the point there. You see, when she goes to the gym, the gym instructor they they only know how to push people. Yes. They do not understand the human body. So, as far as Paul Haja is concerned, I think non-weight bearing exercise like swimming, even if you do not know how to swim, it does not matter. You can wear a belt, a float, mm-hmm. and it makes you float in the in the deep end. Oh, that's a good exercise. And you can just swing your arms and walk in the pool for the half an hour, which is equivalent to your one hour of walking. 15 minutes in the pool is equivalent to your one hour walking. I did that after my uh, chemo, 
when I was very weak and put on a lot of weight. I did it every morning for an hour, and I got back into all my shape. Right, right. I'm still 66 now. I'm 70. Yeah, but, but look at me. I hope I'm an example for other patients. That's all. Because we don't want to go into weight bearing activities like weight lifting and, and trying to touch your toes and all that. We don't need those. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ronnie. Second question? Oh, yes. Maybe Dr. D can help to answer my question. Um, I'm one of the younger myeloma patients, the 40, just you know, early 40s. Yeah. I've got severe osteoporosis um, and I'm on a Zomita up till I finish my chemo. Now, my question is how, how long do we need, or I need to continue on with the Zomita? And then secondly, maybe Dr. Manmohan can help me on this because I'm very active. I used to run in marathons, but you know, being diagnosed with multiple myeloma is a life-changing event. You've got to rethink how you want to do your activities so that you don't um, injure yourself you know, when it comes to um, running and things like that. So my question is, even though you advocate um, brisk walking, if I were to do brisk walking, you know, say, um, for long distance, you know, talking about 10 kilometers, is that safe for me? Because I've got history of a spine fracture, compression fracture, but that was you know, just conventional treatment. So um, what would your advice be? Thank you. So uh, you're a young patient. So for treating myeloma, usually we'll combine with bife first and either pamidronate or jolidronate, all right? So, and for treating myeloma, we usually will continue with the treatment for two years. The bifosphonate, monthly, for two years, two maximum years. usually, yes. all right? Yeah. Of course, you can stop your drugs for myeloma, like Valkyrie, Tylomide, whatever. Uh, usually, bifosphonate will continue until two years, and then we we'll stop the treatment. But for you, you are young, all right? So you have osteoporosis. I suppose we have to co-manage with our endocrine people because osteoporosis in multiple myeloma, I think the better physiology actually is different from other type of osteoporosis in the older age people. All right? Because I'm not so sure whether vitamin D or these things will help in osteoporosis in multiple myeloma or not. Just now I show you the mechanism is because the myeloma cell is actually promoting the osteoclast activity. All right? And of course, it depends on whether you are still having menses, all these things, because you know estrogen will promote the osteoblast activity and uh, suppress the osteoclast activity. I think there are many factors, so you need to look into it. But for treating myeloma itself, actually, the biphosphonate, most of the people will stop after two years of infusions. All right? Yeah. So maybe you can take oral form of this uh, biphosphonate. Yeah. Um, sorry, your first fracture is a compression fracture of the spine. Yes. That was uh, pathological, non -path pathological. Which level of the spine? L1. L1. So what was done? Sorry. Conventional. Conventional. So they, they treated with a brace and all. No. Okay, fine. Okay. Um, did you have a repeat scan or anything like that? MRI? No. Any symptoms now? No. Okay, fine. Um, your question was, uh, could you still continue running? One, the first question. The second question was, if I go to brisk walking, is there a distance of limit or time limit? Okay. Um, I went through a lot of forums for multiple myeloma before I came here. I went through a lot of forums regarding uh, younger patients with multiple myeloma and the amount of activity they can do. Okay. Um, these people are highly educated. Okay. They know their diagnosis in out. Okay. So what? I found out is a lot of them are doing very heavy lifting. Yeah, I know you won't agree with me now, you'll be a bit angry, but the younger age group, if their condition is well controlled based on few parameters which, was, which will be given by your hematologist, okay, and what stage you are in, and so far there's no skeletal related events or your MRI has not shown any spine involvement now, no active spine lesions, and your long bones are all clear, there shouldn't be any restriction to all these activities, okay? But saying so, 
um, long distance running. I'm also a long distance runner. I'm also practicing for long distance. There are a lot of repeated stress injuries that you can get with long distance in a normal bone. Okay, in a normal bone. However, in a pathological bone, I believe the risk is higher than a normal person. Okay, but whether for me, brisk walking is a low impact exercise. It will not affect you so much. But when you go it with a long distance, it gives you repetitive small stresses to the bone. Okay, so you may develop small fractures that you do not see, which is micro fractures. So as long as you have pain, you should stop and need to consult a doctor. As long as that portion is painful, especially around the hips that you complain of pain, that area is sometimes we are a bit worried. I do not think a brisk walking puts a lot of impact on the spine. These are all low impact exercises. But if you want to continue walking and running, I will not stop. If the, if the disease is well early on, been uh, kept in a very low stage, ISS, ISS stage, I do allow patients to go and continue the activities. I do not think there should be a restriction, but if you go on any forum, they will tell you most of them are doing heavy lifting because their hematologist told them can do it. Okay. So, um, I think it should be okay. But if you have any pain, you should, you should reconsider. So, the thing is the pain, right? Yeah. But uh, again, again, will depend on what stage you are in, uh, generally how, what's your age. If it's a very older patient, very, very much older patient, even though they have no multiple myeloma, I don't advocate. I am 70. Yeah, I don't advocate <laughs> lifting anyway, weights. Anyway, my, uh, my CT scan, uh, sorry, PET scan doesn't show any lesions. And I'm taking uh, Zometa. And I don't have pain. And, uh, just in, the, in other words, I don't have pain in my uh, hips or anywhere else. So it's safe for me to continue, I think. Um... I got to decide. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think you got to decide that. No, for me, there's no good answer. For me, there's no good answer for this kind of... Uh, a lot of sportsmen come to us and ask us whether it's safe to do that, safe to do that. It's, it depends on what your body tells you. you know? if, if you really think you have pains, you have to be careful. Even if I have pains, I will stop for at least six weeks to eight weeks because I know something is going on. So if you don't feel that you're well, you have to consider. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I Yes. Okay, I'm from Putrajaya. So every week, Sunday morning, about one hour, I'll be conducting a Senang Wabi. So for the yes, community. So we appoint two people from KBS, Kementerian Belian Sukan, to give a, a Senang Wabi to uh, all the elders. Citizen. Well, yes, citizen, senior citizens, about 40, 50, I think. That one should be okay for 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 multiple myeloma patient, right? Mm -hmm. So that is my recommendation for you. Right, and still, so I'm doing the weightlifting or whatnot. Okay, like you, doctor. Before one week before I diagnosed with cancer myeloma in October two thousand twelve, I'm still active playing football, even though you know, I'm with play for and back in veteran league. So very pity for me. Eh? <laughs> so I, I don't mind, yeah. you don't do it anymore. I stop. Yeah, that's like I said, it's, you know, it's, not, it's difficult for us to give you a good straight answer because what can happen at which stage you are, a lot of things to consider. In a, a normal osteoporotic patients, I can actually tell what is your fracture risk based on your BMD. Okay, I can tell you how, when you're going to get a fracture or how soon you're going to get a fracture. Okay, and what your risk. But for multiple myeloma and in a cancer patient, it's very unpredictable. I can't really tell when exactly, what can you do, how far you can do. But if I see a younger age group with a good um, low staging and well-controlled condition, I allow a more harder exercises.